For those of you who were here last week, we delved into an area of Christian thought called liberation theology. Liberation theology. I owned at the beginning of the class that liberation theology is a subject that challenges me, uh, and I enumerated some ways that that challenges me, and I'll come back to those in a moment, but that it's good to be challenged sometimes, particularly when we're asking questions about the nature of God. It's good to have ideas that come and say to us, do you have it right? Do you have him figured out? It's also good for us to keep asking these questions that the ancient theologians have been asking and that modern theologians have been asking, who is God? What are his characteristics? What does he want for us in our lives? The theologies of St. Augustine of Hippo were written in the fourth century. They they represented (coughs) Augustine's best effort to, to capture the nature of God. Thomas Aquinas did it five or six hundred years later. The Reformation theologians did it five or six hundred years after that. And the Liberation theologians continued that work in the 20th century. Not every one of their ideas will prove the test of time, just like not every one of Augustine's ideas proved the test of time. But some will. And what we'll come out of this with is a deeper understanding of the God who made us and who loves us and who sends us out to make a difference in his world. When you study liberation theology, you can't escape the work of Gustavo Gutierrez. Gustavo Gutierrez is a, uh, I believe, a Dominican uh, priest in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, He's still alive and writing. He teaches at Notre Dame. Uh, And he was the one who first gave voice to this movement of theology that was going on around the time of the Second Vatican Council in Latin America. The key, questions, <clears throat> excuse me, the key questions that they were exploring in that time and in that place were, where is God in the midst of all of this extreme poverty that we see around us? And what is the church's mission? Where is God in the midst of urban poverty and rural poverty? And what is the church's mission? He gave us the idea, and if you need to, if somebody says to you, well, do you know the theology of Gustavo Gutierrez? There's one phrase that you need to remember, and you can show off at cocktail parties, and this is it, the preferential option for the poor. What Gutierrez argues is that Jesus' life and ministry showed him spending an awful lot of time with the outcasts of society. We have him hanging out with the tax collectors. We have him hanging out with the people in need. We have him hanging out with prostitutes. We have him going into the wilderness where the Bedouins live. We have this example that he is seeking to ally himself with those who do not have other allies. And so too should his church. That's the fundamental concept here of the preferential option for the poor. In Gustavo Gutierrez's later writings, he gives us a little bit of room in how we want to interpret that, basically saying, don't take my my words and my structure as a new gospel, take the idea. Who are you allied with? Who are you standing with? And that's going to be core to our understanding of liberation theology. When we develop this a little bit further, we get a legacy of understanding ecclesiology, Ecclesia, the church, ology, wisdom, words about. So ecclesiology, words and understanding about the church. We get four key ideas about how the church will live in this place where it seeks to be allied with the poor. The church will be first the sacrament of liberation. The sacrament of liberation. Can somebody give me the Episcopal Church's working definition of a sacrament? Do do others now have more confidence since Lisa got it so right? What's what's a sacrament? An outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. An outward sign of an inward grace. The church will be the outward sign of the grace that God offers of liberation for all people. The church will model the behavior of liberation. The church will seek to bring about liberation. The church is the seed of God's reign. 
the seed of God's reign. And this is such interesting language. Um, I've learned a lot about agriculture since moving to this part of the world. You don't have to drive very far uh, to uh, be in very rural country around here. And the concept of a seed would seem to make a lot of sense in this region because the seed is something that you put into the fertile ground and you let that die so that something new can grow. And what a big deal that leaders in the Roman Catholic Church, supported by Pope John XXIII, Pope Paul VI, and Pope John Paul II, would say, it's okay for some of the old ways of being church to die so that new ways of being church can bloom. It's okay for um, parts of the society that is so deeply entwined with the Roman Catholic Church. It's okay for some of those structures and some of those practices to die so that something new can grow in its place. The church's job is to be the seed that will let its form die so that the reign of God can come in. The church as the seed of the reign of God. The church is also a gathering of people. The church is not the beautiful buildings that we have. The church is you. The church is the diversity that is you. The church is the poor whom God loves. The church is the rich whom God loves. The church is the outcast whom God loves. The church is the powerful whom God loves. The church is all of those people gathered together. And how do we make sure that we are an assembly of all people and a gathering of people who are on mission. And then the last one, the church is a place for healthy conflict. The church is a place for healthy conflict. By that, they don't mean we get as strong as we possibly can so that we can come in here healthy to beat up on our neighbors. It means that this is a place where we acknowledge that we are all pilgrims on a journey and that not one of us has a full understanding of the ways of God, of the ways of faith, but that we're going to be better off together, and that the conflict that comes from receiving a challenging idea is actually a good one, because it will cause you to think again, does my idea make sense? Has my position been critiqued by this alternative argument? Do I want to shift my understanding, my behavior? This is what we did last week, um, and uh, I've gotten a number of emails um, this week, which is always a good sign because it means that people are thinking about things. Um, and I want to just name a few fears that may be out here. And these were many of the fears that I had when I first encountered this theology. Looking at last week's notes, that's why it's not making sense. Here we go. I'd like to name a few fears. The first fear is that life is a zero-sum game. If some people get raised up, then other people have to be brought down. I'm not sure that's true, but we're going to hold on to that for a moment, that one of the fears is the fear of a zero-sum game. There's another fear that I might be standing up here and asking you to do something untenable. Jesus says to the rich young man, go and sell everything you own, give the money to the poor, and then come follow me. Could you all attend to that before the 1030 service, please? I put your brokers on notice. They're waiting in their offices for you. Not the case. Not going to happen today. There's some, there might be some anxiety that I'm about to roll out a grand church program that's going to take us in one direction and that's going to affiliate us with ideas that may not be comfortable for all of us. Not going to happen today. Not going to happen today. I am going to tell you what is going to happen today, though, and it might even be more scary. I'm going to ask you how, what this means to you. Because let's remember that core value that the church is a gathering of people, a gathering of dis diverse people. And the question that I'm most interested in isn't what direction, what policy, what uh, action is our vestry going to take or our clergy going to take. My question is you. The assembly of people in this room, weighing these ideas, being challenged by these ideas, and asking yourself the question, what does it mean to me? There will be no test, there will be no accountability, nobody will be evaluating any documents after this. 
But let that be your fear today. Am I going to be unsettled? And know that this is a safe place for that to happen and that God goes with us on the journey. Anything else before we begin? I don't see anybody leaving, which is a good thing, always a good sign. Barbara? Mm. Sure. So Barbara has asked me a question about um, context. What was the Roman Catholic Church like in Latin America in the middle part of the 20th century? It's a good question. This would have been the pre-Vatican II Roman Catholic Church. So the Mass would have been celebrated in Latin. The authority of the priests would have been substantial and significant. The traditional old-fashioned understanding of the sacraments would have been uh, in force and in effect. These were Roman Catholic churches in Roman Catholic countries, so they had a lot of access to people in power. They had a sort of establishment role. Um, and uh, we then had around them extreme poverty, which is the key, so that we have extreme poverty around them, likely not people who are literate at all, uh, certainly not literate in Latin. Uh, so seeking, the, the church was seeking to take down a huge barrier that lay between them and the concerns of the poor. I think those would be some of the factors. Is that helpful? Good. Jim. It is not Gutierrez's list. Uh, this is based on an essay in, um, in an anthology that I've been using. This was written by Alvaro Magaña, Magaña who is a, another theologian, but not Gutierrez. Mm -hmm. And I can, uh, if anybody would like to see my notes and citations, I'm glad to send them to you this week. Julie. So did everybody hear Julie's question? What is the definition of poor? <laughs> Julie, it's like I've planted you. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> Who are the poor? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to call that a segue, and you're always grateful when someone gives you your segue. So we had a um, question pending at the end of last week's class. Who are the poor? Uh, what do we mean by this? Um, and I went to Gutierrez's own definition of the poor, and I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to summarize it. These are Gutierrez's words. What then does being poor mean? I believe that a good definition does not exist, but we can approximate it if we say that the poor are the non-persons, the insignificant ones, the ones that don't count either for the rest of the society and far too frequently for Christian churches. The poor are the ones who have no possibility to speak to change their predicament. The poor are the ones who constitute a despised and culturally marginalized race. At best, the poor are present in statistics, but they do not appear in society with proper names. We do not know the name of the poor. They remain anonymous. The poor ones are socially insignificant, but not so to God. Those are Gutierrez's words, and I'm going to offer a summary. The poor are the voiceless, the nameless, and the insignificant. Interesting that he's not saying the cashless here. He's talking about a societal placement. And who are the people that we would allow to be insignificant, allow to be nameless, is the question that's being asked. Of course, however... No one is insignificant for God. This question of namelessness is interesting to me. Um, I love teaching uh, about Genesis and the Genesis stories, and there's, I believe it's Genesis 3, it might be Genesis 4, where uh, God brings all the animals to Adam, and Adam gives them their name, and what Adam called them is what they're called to this day. So Adam was the one who said, cow, or horse or whatever, and they bear those names to that day. It comes just after Adam is given stewardship over uh, the whole of the creation, right? So he's, God says, I put all this into your care. And then he brings him the animals because the person who gives the name is the more powerful person, right? Parents name their children because the parents are the more powerful people. It shows a, it shows a possession. It shows an identity. It shows a uniqueness. 
And what Gutierrez is offering is that when we condense people into the poor, rather than giving them names, rather than asking their names, rather than asking what their concerns are, that's where we see the marginalization. And nobody is nameless before God. There's an experience we had um, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago now, that when we had just gotten our um, uh, cubbies out on the side lawn there, um, somebody took shelter one night in between two of the cubbies, and it was on a Saturday night. Um, and we came in on Sunday morning, and Jim is usually the first one here, and, and took notice of this person. Um, and I then sort of immediately went into, well, how do we keep the community safe? And he said that he wanted to come to church. Well, is that okay? And we're sort of working through these questions on the fly. Um, and what I came down to was, um, if you'd like to come to the 8 o'clock service, by all means, um, but we have a lot of kids around and all of that, and we don't know who you are, and so it's not, we, we can't have you here later in the day. That was fine. He sat in the back. His name was Sylvester. Um, sat in the back, and I realized that he knew all of the words to the 8 o'clock service. And for those of you who are 8 o'clockers, that's something. That's something. I had made a judgment about him based on where he had slept the night before, and my judgment was inaccurate. What was accurate was he's housing insecure. What was inaccurate is that he was a total stranger to the church. It turns out that every church in Dyersburg knows exactly who Sylvester is, and he was down here trying to sort of get ahead and took shelter between the cubbies, and I had made a judgment about him based on his circumstance. I was grateful that I had the chance to set that right and talk to him and sit down and say, tell me a little bit more about your story because this is obviously not your first time in an Episcopal church. I wish I had done that first. And it's just an example of as I look back, I wish I had done that differently, and I hope the next time I will do it differently. It's not judgment. I don't look back on myself and say, well, you terrible human being, Sandy. I just look back and say, I wish I had done that one differently, and hopefully the next time I will. Not giving up on the concerns for the community, but just trying to approach another person in his personhood. As I go through this, hear that theme. How do we see the people that we might not otherwise see? And that's really all I'm going for today. Let me take it one step further. I'm relying on Gutierrez here, um, who does uh, what's called exegesis, which is a Greek word meaning to draw out on the story of the anointing at Bethany. Um, when you try to use that great seminary word exegesis, you'll sound very, very smart. Just make sure you don't say exit Jesus, right? <laughs> Entirely different protocol uh, that you're following at that point. Um, the story of the anointing at Bethany, we're going to read it together, um, but let's just go through the highlights, right? This is just before Jesus' betrayal. In St. Mark's Gospel, it is literally just before Jesus' betrayal. The very next paragraph is the Judas paragraph. Jesus is in Bethany. He is sitting there. People are at table, and this woman comes in. She doesn't have a name. That's going to be significant for us. She comes in, and she breaks open the perfume, and she anoints Jesus' feet. Right? Is this all sounding familiar? And then uh, the disciples say, um, uh, why is she wasting that ointment? She should have sold it and given it to the poor. And then Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. The story appears in all four Gospels. We're going to work on Mark's account uh, because that's what Gutierrez worked on. Um, and I'm going to offer a few observations. Can I ask someone to read the lesson? It's on the side of the page that has these two pieces of art and just one paragraph. Can I ask for a reader, please? Amy, I'm going to let you uh, whisper in my ear here. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's fun. Welcome to church. Thank you. <laughs> While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper... As he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? 
She has performed a good service for me, for you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Thank you. Well. Does that story sound familiar? You'll see I've given you two um, artistic renderings of it. One is sort of the more uh, classic uh, image where we have a lily white Jesus sitting at table with people with very fancy robes and things. Um, and then we have an alternative image that might make it come home a little bit more for us with modern figures and modern clothing. What are the key ideas here? What do you get from this passage? Don't be so quick to judge. Thank you. So what, Miss, what Missy just offered for those who couldn't hear is that uh, the disciples have been following Jesus for his whole ministry, but yet they are poorer in spirit than uh, this one woman who just appears on the scene with her jar. Charlie. Nobody told her to do it. She did it on her own. She didn't wait to be told, didn't wait to be invited even. Just did it. Mm -hmm. Peggy just offered, couldn't that be the Spirit of God inspiring her to do it on her own? I think that's entirely possible. They're in a leper's house. That's a really interesting observation. Who would have been one of the outcasts of that society? Certainly the lepers. Uh, when we look back on this, there are any number of physical diseases that could have been categorized at that time as leprosy, but what we're talking about is something that is physically uncomfortable to be around, or a, a physical condition that makes other people uncomfortable, something that is likely communicable, uh, so people who would be sent out to the edge of the city. And here he is in the house of a leper. Edward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Literally outside of the church, Edward is, is sharing with us. Um, yes, Stacy. Um, I was just thinking that authentic love really does break social norms. Mm, authentic love breaks social norms. I think that's wonderful. Wonderful. Let's talk about that location just a little bit more. Um, so Bethany, uh, for those of you who've been to the Holy Land, you'll remember it's on the other side of the Kidron Valley, right? So you've got Jerusalem up here, then you've got the Kidron Valley with um, Gethsemane down at the bottom, and then you've got the Mount of Olives that comes up over here, and Bethany's up on top of the Mount of Olives. Uh, today, it's separated by the Israeli fence, um, uh, but it's, at that time, it would have just been across the valley. But it's outside of Jerusalem. You know, it's its own community, but it is outside of Jerusalem. And Gustavo Gutierrez points out, and he adds it just sort of as this little note at the end of his treatment of this passage, Bethany is derived from the Hebrew words bet, meaning house, and ani, meaning poor. So he is in the house of the leper in the town of the poor when this woman comes in with an alabaster jar or a jar of perfume and breaks it open, and the disciples say, shouldn't you be more concerned about the poor? And Jesus says, shouldn't you be more concerned about what I'm doing in the world? Interesting balance. Gutierrez also offers that this passage can be used to uh, withhold us from doing things for the poor, right? The poor you'll always have with you. So why bother making anyone, any fewer poor people? You're not going to make any difference. You're not going to make any dent, Right? Gutierrez argues that that is an incorrect interpretation of this passage and that the passage refers back to Deuteronomy 15 where it says, there will always be poor among you. 
And he argues, and I would concur, that Deuteronomy 15 makes it clear that the poor, having poor around you is not God's desire, but it is a reality. And when there are poor around you, your hands are to be open in generosity and kindness. This sets up one of those times, like Augustine talked about, where the city of God and the city of man are in tension with one another. In God's kingdom, surely there will be no poverty, but in our kingdom there is. These two cities are at tension with one another, and how can we be a part of pushing forward for the city of God rather than giving up and letting the city of man overtake us? When I read things like this, I always feel like the pressure is on me to solve all of the world's problems. And I don't think that's what the argument is here. I think it's saying, for you and how you live your life, how can we do better? How can we push towards the kingdom a little bit more? It's a process, not a binary. Either you're out or you're in. It's how can we consistently go deeper in our faith? How can we consistently do better for our community and our neighbors and our faith? How can we keep improving? rather than just judging ourselves for not being all the way at the end so far. The starfish story. I don't know the starfish story. Help me out. So uh, this guy's walking down the beach, and he sees all these starfish washed up on the shore, thousands of them everywhere. And the guy stays and checks them in his backyard. He walks up and he says, why are you doing that? I mean, you can never get all of them back in there. And he says, well, I just want that for me. Mm -hmm. Did everybody hear Vance? So she shared the starfish story that a person is walking down the beach and sees all these starfish washed up on the beach and he starts picking them up and throwing them back in and somebody else comes along and says, why are you doing that? You're never going to throw them all back in. And he said, well, I just helped this one, didn't I? The starfish story. I like that. Had I known that last night, there would have been a starfish on the next slide. <laughs> Julie's got me figured out, but you're, you're, still, uh, you're still throwing new stuff at me. It's also, it's also worthy of note when we look at this passage that God describes the woman's service as good, as good. Good is one of those words that we throw around in our society sort of carelessly and haphazardly, but the Bible uses very carefully. Remember back to Genesis 1, on the first day God created this and he looked and it was good. And on the second day, he created all this, and he looked, and it was good. Dot, dot, dot. On the seventh day, he rested, and he looked at the whole of his creation, and all together, all those good things were very good. Very good. So it's significant that Jesus is telling us that what's happening here is good. Peggy. Mm-hmm. That we have, a, we have a Christian obligation to be reaching out to other people, not to sort of pull tight around ourselves. Mm-hmm. Very good. Very good. Anything else on the anointing at Bethany? I'm sorry, Jim, could you say that again? The final sentence is interesting. Wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jim just offers that that last sentence says that this story is going to be remembered forever, and here we are 2,000 years later studying this story. So Jesus had a, had a good sense that something really significant was taking place. All four. Yep, all four. Daniel. So Daniel offers that this is, the disciples are saying this is a waste, and Jesus says this is an act of worship, which is out of character for him. That's interesting. Why is Jesus behaving out of character here? I wonder, and this is Gutierrez's idea, if we might not have a little bit of role reversal. Remember, Jesus is going to be betrayed in the next sentence. The next sentence. 
Jesus will be betrayed. And this woman comes and offers compassion to the one who's about to suffer. Perhaps what she is doing is modeling exactly what he wished his disciples would be doing. Not sitting at the table sort of speculating about tomorrow, but doing something compassionate for someone who is going to be suffering. I think that's a worthy, uh, worthy interpretation. Julie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what Julie has just asked is she wonders if the, the woman in the story is rich or at least has access to resources in order to make this and that she was, and Julie, correct me if I'm going wrong here, um, she was, uh, Jesus was embodying the poor and she was embodying the discipleship. Mm-hmm. And we don't know about her. We don't know if she was a woman who had a hundred more vials of perfume sitting on her bedside stand or if she was a person who used everything she had uh, in order to buy this one. The story doesn't tell us. The story also doesn't tell us her name. She's just a woman who appeared. Women were not in high esteem, esteem, and we don't have any evidence of a male escort with her, husband, companion, father, brother, whoever. She was on her own, coming to do what she thought was right. Also remember that in all four Gospels, it's women who show up at the resurrection first. Right? There's this theme of women figuring out what God is doing and showing compassion for Jesus in a way that the men are a little slower to do. Please. Yeah, we have an interesting wealth issue going on, don't we? That here the disciples are saying, no, away with that, let's give the money to the poor. And then in the next paragraph, Judas is taking some money to turn Jesus into the authorities. That's a good question. So Jim has asked, in the gospel, has Jesus already discussed his impending death? And I believe the answer to that is yes. I'm slightly cautious about saying that because Mark is so brief, and I, I'm not 100% certain. But my suspicion is this is not the first time they're hearing about it. Charlton. Well, I'm, I'm kind of like Dan. I, I, this passage is so like, and help the poor. Mm-hmm. I couldn't have put it better myself. What Charlton offered is that he's troubled by the uncharacteristic nature of Jesus' behavior, and what he takes from it is the statement, uh, is his belief that we need both a relationship with God and a concern for the poor. It's insufficient only to love God and not be concerned with the poor, and it's insufficient only to uh, be concerned with the poor and not to love God. We need both. I think that's a great interpretation. Two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul, and the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Very good. I need to move on because I'm um, uh, burning time here. But I want to um, ask you, I want to make an observation about this um, passage. Here we have the disciples, as Missy had mentioned, missing the point. And we have this woman coming into the picture whom we don't know, don't know anything about, won't see again, at least to our knowledge, um, who is teaching them something. The um, liberation theologians give us the idea of the re-evangelization of the church. The re-evangelization of the church. So we all have known and loved Jesus for a very long time, but the presence of the poor among us will teach us something new about Jesus, and that will be the re-evangelization of the poor. And you start to say, well, how can I meet God again, right? I've known God since I was a child. I've got my Sunday school pin. I was confirmed. Um, The prayer book I use on Sunday mornings was given to me on the day of my my confirmation. I've got proof. The person who gave it to me was there. Um, You know, I, I know God. How can I meet God again? And when I was wrestling with that question, Um, When I was wrestling with that question this week in preparation for class, um, I remembered a similar question in the third chapter of St. John's Gospel, 
where we meet a gentleman named Nicodemus. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born from above. And Nicodemus says to Jesus, how can anyone be born after having grown old? And I think that we can learn a lot from Nicodemus, who thought that he had everything figured out. But he was willing to be re-evangelized. He was willing to say, maybe God's doing something new and maybe I need to get to know God in a new way. And the liberation theologians invite us to be open to this idea of re-evangelization, of meeting God in new ways than we had ever met him before, and being open to the idea that God might teach us something new about God's self. How can anyone be born after having grown old? You can. You just have to want to. Some of uh, you may be encountering these ideas as a cohesive theology for the first time, and uh, if that's so, then I'm doing my job. Um, But you shouldn't be encountering the themes for the first time. These ideas have been around us at Holy Communion uh, for a goodly while. Many of you will remember uh, a visit that we got from Dr. Walter Brueggemann about two years ago, Dr. Brueggemann being one of the, uh, almost inarguably, the premier A Christian scholar of the Old Testament, still alive today, uh, spoke in our um, sanctuary. And if you look on the other side of your sheet, I took out a quotation, uh, not from any of his books, uh, but from what he said. I transcribed it myself, so I know it's accurate, but forgive the punctuation if there are any problems. And this came at the very, very end of Dr. Brueggemann's lecture, and it was in response to a theology student who was saying, shouldn't our concern be principally the forgiveness of our sins, not principally concerned with others? Um, This whole idea of sort of personal relationship rather than focused on the world. And Dr. Brueggemann said to him the following, the good news of the gospel is that in you, is that you in your sin and me in my sin, we have been forgiven. He bore the transgressions of us all. The question is, what shall we do with our forgiven life? The answer is go. Go to the neighbor. I don't want to dismiss the whole agenda of atonement, but the long history of the church has been so preoccupied with that agenda that we've failed to notice what the Jesus movement is all about. Being forgiven is not the end of the drama. Being forgiven in order that we may love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Um, Dr. Brueggemann's lecture is still up on our YouTube channel. If anyone would like to go and listen to it, it it's well worth your time. Um, And then about two years after that, and about nine months ago, we met Father Greg Boyle of Homeboy Industries, um, a premier voice in the, um, not just in the church right now, but in the community about how to work in with urban poverty. And Greg Boyle offered this, as part of his talk, which um, uh, is also reflected in his book, but this is from his talk. How do we, with God, imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside of that circle? How do we imagine a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it? We are all invited in our own particularity to stand at the margins because the truth of the matter is that if we stand at the margins, the margins will get erased. We get to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop and with the disposables so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. Challenging ideas, but ones we've been hearing a lot lately. I offer this reflection uh, as a connection to our speaker series, which is such an important part of our life together, um, but also to show this is not just a limited body of theology that one could accept or reject. This is starting to work its way into the way that Christian leaders think today. And I would say that it has relevance not just for Christian leaders, but for um, for Christians in general. Our experience of God should drive us to the margins because it is there that we experience God in new ways. The Good Samaritan does not simply acknowledge the battered man. He stands in solidarity with him. 
So what next? What next? We have this model of the church as a sacrament of liberation, of the church as the seed of the reign of God, of the church as an assembly of diverse people, and of the church as a place for healthy conflict. What do we do with that? What do we do with that? I'll tell you, for Holy Communion as a church, we've been working with some of these ideas already. The church as the sacrament of liberation, that we've been redeveloping our outreach ministries over the last several years to focus on relationship, not just charity. So it's not simply we're sending money to Emmanuel Center and money to MIFA. We are going to Emmanuel Center and we are going to MIFA. We are going to Shady Grove Elementary School so as to be present physically, to be in relationship with somebody that we might not otherwise meet. With regard to the seed being the seed of the reign of God, for me, that ties together here at least in the place of healthy conflict. Somehow, Holy Communion has staked out a middle space in a polarized world. I have no idea how we did it, but somehow we did. And we can have classes like this one that challenge us to think about where our privilege is and what we do with that privilege. And we can do it in a way that each invites each one of us to develop his or her own response rather than needing to say, well, this is the expectation, and if you don't do this, then you've fallen short of expectation. Somehow we have found a way in this church to see difficult conversations as an invitation to go further and an invitation to go deeper rather than a threat. I'm pretty proud of us for that because there aren't a lot of places around that can make that claim. I think that shows a little something about the reign of God because no matter what the polarized figures on the television news think, we're all going to end up in heaven together, and we're going we're to have to deal with some of this in retrospect, <laughs> right? But we have an example of a place where people who disagree can do so in a way that is healthy and productive, and I think that reveals to us a little bit of the kingdom of God, just a bit. Is it perfect? No. Is there room to do more? Absolutely. Is it good nonetheless? Yeah, it is. And it's something to be real proud of. But then lastly, the church is a collection of people, faithful people, who seek in good faith to do what God would have them do. And this is where I need to turn it back over to you, like I said I was going to in the first place. Each one of us is going to have to make a decision about how these ideas are relevant in our lives. Each of us will make a different decision about how these ideas are relevant in our lives. Is it for you mentoring, developing a serious and intentional long-term relationship with somebody whom you would not otherwise have met or somebody who's disadvantaged by her circumstances? Is it for you political activism where you're going to get involved in issues uh, that matter to you and that you think would fulfill these ideas? Is it charity in the way that you um, arrange your giving dollars? Is it for you getting to know some of the people that you might not know but who are in your daily life, the housekeeper, the auto mechanic, the person who uh, cleans the hotel rooms in the place that you're business traveling? One of the most beautiful things I'd seen in a long while was a dinner in this room. I can't remember what the occasion was, but we were all sort of at round tables and I was doing the butterfly thing that I do to make sure that you all know that I love you and was going around and I saw sitting at a table right over in that corner um, a person who was very senior in business sitting next to a person who was housing insecure and having a conversation. And it was beautiful because the world out beyond these walls would not value that. But here we do. Lisa. So what Lisa just offered is that many of the things we do here are to fill ourselves up in, um, in spiritual ways such that we, our poorness, our deficit is filled, and then we can go and make a difference 
in the world. And I think that gets right back to what Charlton was saying, is that it's inadequate simply to help the poor, and it's inadequate simply to have a relationship with God. You have to do both. And both, I think the liberation theologians would say the two are going to feed on each other. That as you get to know and be in relationship with the people who most need to feel God's liberation, that's going to impact your understanding of Jesus. And as your relationship with Jesus grows, that's going to impact your desire to make a difference in the world around us. And it becomes a, not a vicious cycle, but quite a wonderful cycle, the two feeding on each other. Other thoughts? It is. Um, the, Bill just shared that Brueggemann, in the, actually in the passage that's right before you, turned the crystal from, yes, you have had all of your sins forgiven. Why stop? That's a terrible place to stop, was exactly what he said, which I just loved. Don't stop there, please, don't stop there. For what reason has God forgiven your sins? Or take that one step farther, as a result, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Is it not that gratitude should be bursting forth on all sides? Edward. Two sentences of Mm-hmm. The work is not ours to finish, but say it again. To take no part in it. Mm. Ben. You know, the expression is more blessed to give than to receive. It's not just energy for those in the margins mm-hmm. rather than for our, mm-hmm. our own glory. Yeah. Yeah, so that we're all motivated to serve in so many ways, but can we use that in, for, in the direction of the margins? Jane. I think sometimes we think that we give ourselves away. Mm-hmm. Jane just offered us that we might think that being in relationship with um, the poor, um, and I'm, I'm trying not to use a group reference, but we'll use it for now, that um, we might think it's going to be onerous or unpleasant or uncomfortable or demanding, and that in fact it might become one of the greatest rewards. Hester? Our image of God will become more rich when we encounter Christ mm-hmm. see. in those we walk alongside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Julie just pushed back a little bit on the word conflict here, and perhaps my introducing conflict created a little conflict. There it is. Um, the, uh, but what she would offer is healthy relationship, and I think that's absolutely right, grounded in the baptismal covenant to respect the dignity of every human being, those who are um, similar to us, those who are different from us, those who think similarly to us, those who do not think similarly to us. Um, and what I, would, what I would do is just nuance that and deepen it a little bit to say that part of healthy relationship is figuring out how to have honest conversations with one another. And you can think about your intimate relationships, be that with a spouse, be that with your children, be it with your parents, as you're dealing, uh, those of you who are dealing with sort of aging parents. Um, there's a lot of difficulty in telling the truth in love, as Ephesians says. It's much more tempting to lie, just to polish it off. No, 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 that's fine. It doesn't trouble me at all when you do that and come and stay for three weeks. No, no, it's fine. We, we love every minute of it, right? It's much more tempting to lie, much easier to lie. But the Bible says we need to speak the truth in love, always the truth, always in love. And there's a difference between telling somebody off and telling them the truth because you love them and to have that truth be told within the context of loving them. Because that's how relationships go deeper. I think that's true in our relationship with God, and I think where it's true with regard to this material is in our relationship with each other. How am I going to speak the truth, even when it's hard? Jim. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I've never been in a relationship that was free of conflict. Um, That there's just every every friendship, every partnership, every uh, business relationship, there's always been uh, some conflict of some kind. I mean, we're different human beings. It's just natural. And the question is how we deal with that. <laughs> you got to be careful with Bill Vaughn. <laughs> and what I'll offer to that, what, what Daniel said is that um, we invited someone here who did not have a rosy view of the long term of the Episcopal Church. Um, but he came here with a spirit of openness and to learn and saw who we were. Um, Also, I have colleagues around the country who are saying the Episcopal Church is dying right now. And I'm saying, well, I got about 80 people every week in my adult forum. I got another 35 coming to Bible study even when we're off site. Um, We're holding our own with attendance on Sunday morning even as uh, all of the uh, national indicators are going down. I think we're doing pretty well. And they're like, well, yeah, I guess if you want to, you know, measure it that way. (laughs) 
<laughs> you're doing pretty well. Well, I, th I think those are reasonable measurements. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, we are out of time, and what I'm going to offer, uh, just as a conclusion, uh, is I hope that this has challenged you. I hope that there have been a few points when you said, I really wish he hadn't just said that. And I hope that you take that and pray over it and figure out what of that is calling you to revise your view, what of that is calling you to say, no, for me, I have this figured out. I'd love you to go back and take a look and say, this is, these are the ways that I'm intentionally building relationships with people that I wouldn't necessarily cross paths with, and how could I do one more? It's not about a total overhaul of everything we do in church and home life. It's about how we can do just a little bit more. When we look back at all the teachings of Jesus, all the teachings of the law, I want to take off all those centuries of guilt that have been laid upon them. If you can't do exactly what the Bible does, then you're just damned forever and not worthy of being looked upon. It's invitation. Here's the ideal. Here's where you are. How can we go one step further? And you know what? Tomorrow we'll go one step more than that. And we're not going to get to the ideal, but we're going to move along and we're going to do it together because God loves us and we love God and God has given us a world to love. Amen?